great stuff. That's great. So if you've got the Bibles, I used over the years to turn around and looking at the big screen since I was away. They've got this set up here, which I think is going to be better, but it will take some time to get used to it. We'll see how we go. Okay, so our focus today, of course, is on the resurrection. I'm going to talk about that, and the main passage we're going to be looking at is John chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. It'll be on the screen. But you're welcome to read it in your books as well. Maybe someone can give me a page number, us a page number. 872. 872. 872. Page 872. Excellent. Okay, so. This is what John writes. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. And there's no doubt about it, isn't there? Easter is a weird story. It's a story about a dead man, a murdered man, coming back to life. And if you're not a Christian tonight, that's going to be a really hard story to get your head around. Let's face it, outside of Marvel comics and superhero movies, a story like that just doesn't happen. People live and they die and they get stuck in the ground and that's it. So if you struggle with this part of the Christian story, I get it. I don't blame you. On the other hand, if you are a Christian, particularly being a Christian for a while, it can be easy to get used to that story and overlook the weirdness factor. We celebrate Easter every year, and that's a good thing. But like many other things, if you do it year after year after year after year, you can miss the point of it. It can become routine. So whichever camp you're in, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about those two elements. Is the story true? And if it is true, what does it mean for us? Not that we'll cover every detail. My wife in particular will be delighted to hear this is not going to be a three-hour theology lecture. <laughs> but think of it as a few introductory thoughts that get you some seeds to start thinking in new areas, if that helps you. So, here's the first seat, the first sentence. The tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. Of course, if we limit ourselves to the short passage that we've just read, it says nothing about the resurrection. But of course, the context is important here. The four Gospels have their differences of detail, but they all have the same overall storyline. And it's a story of a, a well-known preacher in Israel who gets arrested, falsely sentenced to death, killed on a cross. The body's taken down, placed in a tomb. Two days later, Jesus' followers return to the tomb and discover the body's no longer there. Apparent appearances of Jesus and then the ascension to heaven. And whether or not we accept that storyline, it's pretty much the same storyline whichever gospel you read. So there's a consistency there. It's all very weird. 
but it means that when we read the story of the empty tomb, we can't limit ourselves. It's not a story by itself. It's like chapter one in a much bigger story. It's the dramatic moment in the storyline, in the mystery movie, where the music changes. And all of a sudden, we know something big is going to happen. It's the point at which the question has to be asked, what happened to the body? Let's look at John's account in a little bit more detail because there are some small but significant elements that I personally find hugely encouraging. Hopefully I can inspire you to be encouraged by them as well. So let's go back. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put it. Mary's gone to the tomb because Jesus' body needs to be prepared according to the Jewish burial customs. It needed to be cleaned, anointed with spices, wrapped in a shroud. The problem was that Jesus died on Friday afternoon, shortly before the start of the Sabbath. And you couldn't touch his body in the Sabbath, during the Sabbath because that would make you unclean for the Sabbath rest. So they had to protect the body. The story before, what the one we've read, is about Joseph of Arimathea taking the body down from the cross, putting it in his private tomb, sealing it off temporarily. It's been wrapped in a shroud. So they started, but they effectively had to stop work because they got to the end of uh, official work hours and they need to down tools and come back the next day. It's that kind of mindset. And now it's Sunday morning, and Mary's gone to the tomb to finish the job. Other Gospels talk about a group of women. John focuses just on Mary, because he's about, after this story, to talk about the first resurrection appearance, which was to Mary, and he wants to focus on that. So we do just Mary in this story. And she goes to the tomb and finds that the stone is rolled away and Jesus' body is missing. How does she respond? In the passage that we've just read, how does she respond? I want to answer that question by telling you, first of all, how she does not respond. She doesn't shout, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. She doesn't say that, does she? She responds by going back to the other disciples and saying, they've taken the body. It's not there. So logically it follows that it's been moved or stolen or, or something. Something entirely human and ordinary. That's their first thought. And the reason why I focus on that is that my experience over many years of being a Christian is that when you talk about the truth of Christianity, non-Christians often have a warped picture of what faith is all about. Famous example, unfortunately, again and again, is Richard Dawkins, who says, among many things, a quote like this. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is believed in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. The irony here is that in order to say that, he himself has to ignore the evidence of the Gospels themselves. A person who can say that hasn't read what the Gospels actually say about the resurrection stories, because they say exactly the opposite. We have ordinary people who make ordinary and entirely rational decisions and responses to the events before them. They're not people who believe despite the evidence, in fact, to start with, there were people who disbelieved. In the Gospels, generally, when the women return with stories of angels saying Jesus was alive, how did the disciples respond? Again, they didn't say to the woman, you stupid, stupid woman. Of course, that would happen because we know that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. He prophesied it. They don't say that. This is what they say. This is an example from Luke's Gospel, just a couple of good sentences. They did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. 
Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Are you getting the picture here? This is not a picture of weird delusional faith. This is a picture of disbelief. It's a picture of puzzlement, of wondering what's going on. It's a desire to go and check things out. It's just what we should expect from ordinary, true-to-life, rational people. There's nothing delusional here. And John expands on that in his account. Peter and the other disciple, the other disciple is John. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings, and the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. I'm hoping that you're getting a sense of how true to life all of this is. Peter and John both setting off, puzzled but curious enough to go and look for themselves. Running hard, one outpacing the other. John gets to the tomb first but stops at an entrance just to peek. Stooping and peeking. There's all these little words that point to a real life eyewitness description of what actually happened. Peter comes up and boulders for us, charges right inside the tomb. Who recognizes that as true to life with other stories we know about Peter? And finally, John, the beloved disciple, sneaks into the tomb. He sees the grave clothes laid out just so. He sees and believes. But then immediately the narrative adds, they still didn't understand the scriptures. Once again, the whole realism in the storytelling, we've got a detailed description here of the first discovery of the empty tomb, right down to an honest mixture of faith that is blossoming, but is not yet full blown. That's the kind of picture that we've got here. He saw, this is John, John saw and he believed. What do you think he saw? An empty tomb, of course, but also the grave clothes, the burial items. And this is my personal interpretation of this passage. Other people might read it differently, but it seems to me that there was something about those sheets that was enough for John to see and to believe. And I want to take a moment to see if I can create that picture for you to give you an idea of how I read the passage. So firstly, take a look at this picture. It's obviously an artist's impression because they didn't have cameras in those days. But, as an artist's impression, I actually think this is a bad impression. Because the shroud here looks like my clothes after I've had a round of golf and I strip them off and have a shower and they're just tossed on the floor and there they are. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put this down for a moment. So... I've actually bought a set of clothes. So, there you go. All right, that's the artist's impression. But I want to suggest to you that what John saw was more like this. So I'm going to lay out a different picture here, and I'll leave it there till after the service, and you're welcome to come and have a look and reflect on it. Jesus is my inspiration. two caps, I've got no idea. <laughs>
Now, when you look at something like this, that guy's pretty tall. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I noticed. But here's the thing. When we looked at the clothes in a pile, you didn't think anything one way or the other. But the moment you see it like that, all of a sudden, there's something different about that picture. And what John is describing here is he's describing a disciple who knew Jesus well, who was there during the crucifixion right through to the end, who knew where the body went, who went back two days later, who went into the tomb and took one look at that and believed. And I have a picture in my mind. It's hard to get it from the translation, but I have a picture of Jesus wrapped up in a shroud, wrapped up in a separate covering on his head. He's been laid out on the tomb. At one instance, the body is there, and the next instance, the body is not there. What happens to the shrouds? They certainly don't go all like that, do they? They just sink under the force of gravity, and they can. John went in and he saw where the tomb was. He saw that the shroud literally had not been disturbed because Jesus just wasn't there anymore. That's the picture he's trying to describe. And when I see that and kind of get that vision, it inspires me about the reliability of these passages. It gives me the confidence to trust in something that I haven't seen for myself but I have really good reason from the testimony of others to believe that Jesus truly is alive. And we get all the other stories, equally disbelieving and determined to follow the evidence. Thomas is an obvious example. Who missed Jesus' first appearance, refused point blank to believe unless he saw and felt the evidence for himself. Sadly, history is labeled Thomas as doubting, but not me. I label him as heroically honest. I label him as a true scientist, only going where the evidence takes him. And where did the evidence take him? To crying out, my Lord and my God. And so that gives me the confidence to say this, the tomb is empty and everything is different. Because surely if all of this is true, this has to be the most remarkable story in the history of the universe, doesn't it? Just last week I saw a TV documentary about Australia's very first cryonics company. And this is what their marketing pitch says. If you don't know what cryonics is, it will tell you in the marketing pitch. Cryonics is a cutting-edge scientific process that involves the preservation of a person's body and brain at extremely low temperatures, with the plan that future medical technologies will be able to revive them and potentially cure currently incurable diseases. It's the ultimate embodiment of the human spirit of exploration and the relentless human quest for immortality. At a common sense level, what do we say about that? That's garbage. <laughs> As the quote goes, the only certain things in life are death and taxes. <laughs> Those who know my background know that for a season I worked as a church pastor. And in my first year as a church pastor, I had to take be a celebrant at, although that word celebrant sometimes was a very inappropriate word, a celebrant at 35 or 40 funerals in my first year. So pretty much every week I was doing one, sometimes two funerals in a week. And we talk about funeral celebrants, but in reality there is a deep sadness that many of those people went through. Because at the end of it all, the body goes into the ground and we say goodbye and we walk off and that's it. I'm going to die. You're going to die. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in a year, maybe 10, maybe 50 years. But we will all die. Unless, of course, 
the empty tomb is true. Because the moment we allow that possibility into our lives, everything changes. Let me tell you a story about Stephen. Roger David, if you can do a sport job for me. I need a balloon to be like that. Can you do that? That would be great. Stephen was 16 years old. He just left school and he was working as an apprentice hairdresser. He loved his job and his life was open before him. Until one day he finished work and was driving home and a drunk driver came speeding around the corner on the wrong side of the road. Bang! Stephen was killed instantly. And as human justice this side of heaven happens, the drunk driver was completely uninjured. So what do you say? I didn't know Stephen that well, but I knew his mother very well because she was the worship leader in our church. So what do you say? What do you say when a town has a population of 1,100 people and 800 of them come to the funeral service. What possible basis for hope is there? How can this be anything other than a complete and utter disaster? Unless death turns out to be not the end. Unless somehow against all the odds there is more to the story. We have no reason to believe that unless the tomb is empty. But if it is, everything changes. All of a sudden, in the midst of those painful stories that we've all experienced, the empty tomb adds another voice whispering hope into our lives. Stephen's family had experienced pain before. One of Stephen's brothers had leukemia as a child. And they were strong members of Canteen, which some of you may be aware of as a charitable organisation helping the families of children and teenagers with cancer. And one ceremony, can I have the balloon back now, thanks? That's great. One ceremony that they had to remember children who died was a balloon release. This is not a helium balloon, so I'll let go of it, it'll just drop on the ground. But they used helium balloons and they would let them get they would write messages on it and they let them go and that would be a way of expressing their feelings and emotions and stephen's family wanted to do this at his funeral service so after the formal parts were over we had just a an informal time in the big hall that we were using and lots of the people were getting their balloons organized and i remember watching one girl about seven or eight years old She'd drawn a picture on her balloon and she was running around the hall and all of a sudden the balloon slipped from her fingers and because it was a helium balloon, it didn't do that, it went boom! And it was about a 30 foot high ceiling arch and I looked up at the balloon nestled on the roof and thought, well, that's the end of that balloon. Little did I know because this very smart girl went back into the office, got another balloon, but this time she made it a special balloon and she made it a balloon with a really, really long piece of string attached to one end and a piece of double-sided sellotape that she stuck to the other end. And she went back into the hall and she looked up and she just let go and this balloon went boom, bashed into the first balloon, the two stuck together and then she, with the string, she just reeled the two of them together, catching a fish. Mission accomplished. And ever since then, that's been a picture for me, and I talked about it when we went out to the grave site and we buried Stephen. But you look over a cemetery, and every single place you see, there is a cross. You and I will go into that ground and by ourselves, we'll just stay there. But the picture of the balloon for me is a picture that we're attached to Jesus. We're attached to the one person in history who truly has gone into the ground and come out again. And if we're attached to him, we too get to come out of the ground and celebrate eternal life 
We will be raised with them. And that's God's promise to us. Very briefly, one third sentence. The tomb is empty and God's word can be trusted. John is realistic about the disciples' faith. He ends this part of the story with a comment. Until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. And if you read the various English translations, you get two different strands of idea. Some of them say, until this point, they hadn't understood. Others of them say, at this point, they still didn't understand. And it feels to me like that's an expression of what's going on here. There's the honesty, which is, it's completely obvious that before Jesus was raised from the dead, the disciples were 100% clueless. They just didn't have any idea. But you also get the sense from the way John's written it, that they're still going forward, struggling to get their heads around this remarkable fact. And what's important in this is that Jesus, when he criticizes the disciples, criticizes them not just for disbelieving the resurrection, but also for disbelieving the Old Testament words and prophecies about the resurrection. And we see that so beautifully in that story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus walks alongside them and they tell them all the things that are going on. They, they, Jesus' miracles, we thought he was the one, but he was crucified, dead and buried. Although now it's the third day and some of our group amazed us by saying, they've seen him alive again. What on earth is going on? And Jesus replies, how slow you are to believe. To believe what? He didn't criticize them for not believing the disciples. He says, how slow you are to believe all that the prophets said. As far as Jesus was concerned, it was certainly important for the disciples to be convinced in real evidence that he was alive. And that's why he appeared to them. That's why he was willing to do whatever was necessary to help disciples like Thomas become convinced that it was a true story. But for Jesus, it was just as important to show the disciples that this was no random event. This was a central part of God's saving plans. And the proof of it is in the words of Scripture. God has said what he would do. And he's done it. So not only do we have an amazing story, we have an amazing prediction of an amazing story. And the two together, the promise and the fulfillment, show that God is utterly trustworthy in all that he does. The tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty and that changes everything. The tomb is empty and God's word, once again, is proven to be utterly trustworthy. You can believe it. You can rely on it. And you can rejoice in it. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let's have a look at a question. What does the story of the empty tomb mean to you? Let's talk about that in our groups for a few minutes.
close.